Um, I do want to say if there's anyone 16 or under, uh, I would highly recommend that you not be here and I'm going to just give you a, a moment to leave. Ironically, this information is encouraged to be used across the state for grades you know, K through 12, but um, I wouldn't even want my mother to be here. That's how bad it is, but you, we, need, we need to speak it as it is. So if you need to leave, please do. There is a notion that the Oregon Department of Education thinks it knows what's best for kids. Governor Kitzhaber is in charge of our education and our health care. Please remember this, okay? Uh, even the law says parents know what's best, and Herb here will be speaking about that. And local control is nothing without parents. This quote pretty much captures um, the situation. If an adult in any other context came up to your child and tried to strike up a conversation about self-pleasure or oral sex, you'd likely have uh, words and have, then have words with the police. Uh, this uh, gentleman, his 13-year-old daughter in Kansas, this was back in just July, did feel quite right in her science class, 13 years old. She took a picture of this poster. It made the news, Fox News. This is just the tip of the iceberg. The same curriculum is being used across Oregon. It's called Making a Difference, sixth grade curriculum, and they say this is abstinence-based. With all the messages teens are receiving about sex, what are some of the ways people express their sexual feelings to themselves or to others? Mixed gender classroom, 11, 12, 13 year olds. Um, if, again, the, if the participants has, are hesitant, ask prompting questions. What kind of sex can people have by themselves? What might others do with their mouths? What other things people can do with their hands? Now, the poster that you saw on Fox News that this 13-year-old this took, this is what was on it. Um, also, you've got to understand, you've got to explain your terminology. And as a teacher of 22 years, you've got to do some prep work. So there's uh, defining these terms. You're discussing this. Per perhaps questions arise. And um, how is a teacher going to handle it? I would handle it one way. Who knows what the other teacher, other teachers might do. They might take advantage of the situation and, and take the discussion where it shouldn't go. So here are some definitions uh, that this um, curriculum provides for you to discuss with your students, sixth grade. Um, the Oregon Department of Education thinks it knows what's best for your kids, but they're on, they are, they are getting the message that we're on to them. Uh, 30, they've been having a conference for the last 36 years down in Seaside. Uh, it's no problem. There's been no problem. Well, um, this year it was different, but I'll get back to that. So the ODE is hiding behind words. Health, wellness, safety. Sounds benign. You have to define those terms. Uh, if you knew what they meant by healthy relationships, and healthy sexuality, you would be surprised, shocked. And we can't share all the information with you today. We have our table and information, but we want to just give you um, an overview. These terms are very vague. How do you define them? But a lot of people will hear those big words and go, well, gosh, I'm not an expert. Uh, what Medically accurate, okay, I guess you're right. You're the expert. No, you are. You're the parent. You're the guardian. So for example, what is best practice? I want you to think about a sixth, sixth grader, 11-year-old, 12-year-old. How are you going to discuss this in the classroom? What's the best way to go about discussing your sexuality or healthy sexuality, whatever that means? Pleasure or some other additional items. What is age appropriate for kindergarten in Oregon? It's K through 12 comprehensive sex education. And that is, has been deemed and boasted by the Oregon Department of Education as the most progressive push the envelope type of sex ed laws in the nation. Something not to be proud of. Well, what I'm gonna show you here, and I'm gonna go quickly, but these are some 2012 revisions that um, the ODE deems uh, best practice for children in, around Oregon. And I understand that you've got to define these terms and it depends on the teacher that is in front of your children, where they take it and where they take the conversation. What makes you males and females act the way they do? What kindergartner needs to know how to get medication in the, in the community? They're priming them for other things as they get older. 
yeah, excuse me, um, grades four or five, sexual orientations is in the mix, medically accurate, that buzzword, again, what does that mean? Communicate respect, we know that that's a loaded word. These are loaded words that you need to have your antennas up when you come across them. Grades six through eight, accessing resources, healthy sexuality. Um, health is mental, social, emotional, re reproductive, um, dental, et cetera. It's the whole person, where does that leave the parent? They have a term, healthy, holistic sexuality is a term they're using. Demonstrating using a condom, blah, blah, blah. Uh, high school, advocating and promoting dignity, safe civil environment, reproductive and sexual health care. So, best practice. So this is the sexuality conference I was referencing. We just had it this week. I've gone to a couple of them in the past and the ODE knows and hears our footsteps and they need to hear our footsteps more. And the way you do that is at the local level. And before you leave today, uh, we hope that you um, feel like you, there's some things that you can do. There are things you can do. This picture was taken by Rita Diller. She went last year, she's with STOP, and she's written some fantastic articles. So I want you to understand, this is part of the steering committee, the Oregon Department of Education, Oregon DHS, Oregon Health Authority, Planned Parenthood. And this, this, um, conference, there were 100 people protesting. It got on Channel 2, it got on Channel 6. It's been in the Oregonians, so they're hearing that people have gotten wind of what's going on. This is uh, one of the workshops from last year. This is a piece of artwork, supposedly from some youth that are, were teaching a workshop called You Say Porn, I Say Porn. Youth teaching youth is a big thing going on around the state. Yucks and yums map, teen to teen. So we all have spots on our body that we would like our lovers to pay more attention to, but we also have places we'd like them to stay the heck away. At this conference, we have six, sixth graders, middle school, high school, probably about a third of them. They go get this information and they're called to go out to their districts and they're empowered, they're jazzed, they want to spread the word, and they are. We're not going to take questions till we're done because we want to get this information to you um, and hopefully we'll have some time. No universal right or wrong. Again, teen to teen. Abstinence is, well, we're all being abstinent here. You, even that word is defined differently. So it just means we're not having sexual relations right now. <clears throat> this is a um, overarching youth, Oregon Youth Sexual Health Plan. If you want to know where we are and where, where they want to take us, why we, what their intentions are with school-based health centers, CCOs, Oregon Health Authority, healthcare, all that, this is a great um, document to, to look at and you can look at our website or you can just uh, pull it up online. Uh, within that document, <clears throat> which is touted across the nation as, um, you know, so wonderful, this is just one little snippet of it. Emergency contraception to women under 18, and just to have some on hand. And reproductive services in Oregon are from any age, and it's total confidential. So a nine-year-old without parental parents knowing. This is a documentary that features the Oregon Youth Sexual Health Plan. It also has um, the Oregon Department of Education sexuality specialist interviewed on here. Notice the three pictures, the two girls, boy and a girl, two boys. And I just want to point out the last bullet, put politics and ideology aside. You tell me this is not ideolo ideology? Yes, it is. Uh, you also have to, when you think of curriculum, you have to think also of the resources, the speakers that come into the classroom, the links, the websites that are encouraged for youth to access. Planned Parenthood, take care down there. Uh, Scarletine, Go Ask Alice, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. So honestly, comprehensive sex education, K-12, is carte blanche, anything goes. Now, like I said, I don't want you to leave with your shoulders down. So Herb is going to speak to you here about uh, what you can do, what, what laws you have on your side, and what are some practical things you can do. Thank you. Well, now that Lori has horrified you, my job is to be the voice of reason and calm and perspective so that all of you feel as if <clears throat> uh, all is not lost. 
But uh, as, a, as we start out, I just wanted to point out that much of what I'm going to be covering is in handouts, which are back near the back door, and I would really encourage you to pick up all of these things. I'm going to go breezing through these pretty quickly because we got started late and we can't stay late. But the information is right there, and most of it is pretty explanatory. How many of you know how to read? Okay. So you're going to be able to follow and look at later on much of what I'm going to tell you. And the, the critical thing here is to, you may think, after seeing a whole list of government agencies and all of that, that the deck is stacked against you. And what I would say is the deck is only stacked against you if you let the deck be stacked against you. Because as you're going to see, the law generally um, gives parents preference in a lot of these things. And some of the people who are pushing this stuff haven't read the law recently. So, where does that law come from? Well, it starts with the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause uh, in the U.S. Constitution. That is the basis upon which parents are determined to have the fundamental right to direct the care and upbringing and education of their kids. And you'll see how that plays out here in a moment. Now, for those for whom the Constitution isn't quite good enough, there's also a body of federal statutes and regulations that, that reinforce that. And finally, even in the state of Oregon, we have a bunch of statutes and regulations which also reinforce that, uh, those concepts. So let's talk about the, uh, what, the, what the Constitution says. Now, most of us love to, to hate the US Supreme Court. And of course, I get to deal with their handiwork all the time. But the reality is that over a period of 75 years, as you will see here, the US Supreme Court has been shockingly uniform on parents being in charge, okay? So if anybody disagrees with you at any point when you're talking to a school official about this stuff, just say, you know, the only people who agree with me are the nine people in black robes in Washington, D.C., okay? Now this case, uh, the, the Pierce case, actually came from a little western state called Oregon back in 1925, and the issue in this case was whether or not Catholic kids had to go to public school. And as you can see, the U.S. Supreme Court said, guess what? The child is not a creature of the state. Guess who owns the, the child? The parents do, or God, but it's not the state, okay? And about 20 years later, they had occasion to deal with it again, and at that point, again, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court said, parents come first, not the government, not the Oregon Department of Education, not the Oregon Health Authority, parents. For those who aren't really paying close attention, they spoke to it again in 1972 in the, in the Wisconsin v. Yoder case. And here they said that it's not just about parents' rights, it's also about parents' obligations. What are the, some of the obligations that parents have? To inculcate moral standards, religious beliefs, and elements of good citizenship. Now how many of you think it's good enough? if you think that you have the authority to direct the care and upbringing and education of your kids, and you have nine people in Washington, D.C. agreeing with you, how many think that's a pretty compelling majority? Okay, And again, a lot of the people that, in the, that are pushing this agenda we're talking about ain't paying attention to the law. Okay, They're generating some of their own, but they're not paying attention to, to well-established law. And again, in this uh, case in 1977, again, the family is deemed to be really important in terms of passing on values, not the people that Lori was telling you about. And in two, the year 2000, the re U.S. Supreme Court reached back 75 years to the Pierce v. Society of Sisters case, and they repeated, our Constitution long ago rejected any notion that a child is a mere creature of the state. So, who owns your kids? Okay. So that's kind of the constitutional framework. Let's talk a little bit about what federal statutes have to say about this. And, and I just picked two that are directly pertinent to this particular area. Uh, one of the common things that happens in a lot of the curriculum stuff that, uh, that Lori was talking about is they give kids surveys. And even doctors are now in the position now, uh, oftentimes today, to say um, to a kid, are there any firearms in your house? Has there been any history of domestic abuse? So who in your house has sex with whom? Okay, 
And uh, that uh, FERPA Act basically says, guess what? The government doesn't have the right to have that information. So if you're, you and your kids don't want to provide it, they can't make you give it up. And the Protection of Pupil Rights Act, um, you'll see here in a moment, is reinforced in Oregon law. It basically says if they're going to teach with some materials in the classroom, parents get to see it first. How many like that idea? Okay. One of the things that um, I've learned in the course of dealing with this subject and with others is it sometimes is a good idea to break out the rule book because sometimes the rule book gives you a golden gem or two. And this uh, ORS 336.067 is one of them. One of the things that's required in the education code is that there be special emphasis um, be given in instruction to a variety of things, including respect for parents and the home. So ask yourself if the Oregon Department of Education is suggesting that kids should have access to all kinds of services without their parents' consent. Anybody see a cognitive dissonance there? Okay. Um, and then the, the second statute um, is really important, and this is covered in some detail um, in the handouts, but all it, all it says is that parents have the right to be notified in advance between, b before human sexuality or HIV AIDS uh, instruction is given. So would you like to know about things in advance? Uh, it means that if you don't want your kid to participate in it, you can excuse them. Would any of you like to be able to excuse your kid if you don't want them to sit through this stuff? And lastly, the parent or guardian may inspect the instructional materials to be used before or during the time the course is taught. Just kind of like that federal act, the Protection of Pupil Rights Act. And this is also built into the Oregon administrative rules. So if you're um, a parent and you look at the stuff and you don't like it and you ask your kid to, to be opted out, what may happen? Well, you may hear them say, gosh, nobody else has opted out before. We don't know what to do. Well, in one situation we know about, the student was escorted out of the classroom, handed the same materials that her classmates just got, and she was told to read them by herself in the library. Now, does that sound like opting out of instruction? Uh, the other thing is that if you ask to see stuff, what you may commonly hear is, well, we only have one copy of the curriculum and the teacher needs it. And it's like, well, Okay, I appreciate the fact you've only got one copy of the curriculum and the teacher needs it, but first of all, isn't the teacher supposed to have lesson plans well in advance? Right? In other words, they're supposed to be prepared before the last minute? And um, besides, you really wouldn't want to violate federal and state law by not giving it to me, would you? Okay? So, how many people feel like the deck is hopelessly stacked against you and you have nothing in your quiver to work with. If you pay uh, attention to anything today, pay attention to that second statute. That's, that's your quiver of arrows right there. So if all the law is this clear, how come we have this problem? Why are we having this conversation about this type of curriculum? Well, the reason is that historically, we've all pretty much agreed on Judeo-Christian values, right? Is that true so much anymore? Not so much. Also in the past, everybody kind of knew what the Constitution said. Maybe even members of Congress. <laughs> um, but everybody's kind of forgetting about that, and so they're passing laws, you know, either Congress or the Oregon legislature, they're passing laws that say, okay, this is the rights that parents have. How hard is it to amend the Constitution? Very. How hard is it to amend a statute? Not very. Okay? So we have that kind of a problem going on. People think, well, gee, if, the, if Congress passes a law, that's the end of the conversation. No, the Constitution says something about that. And the last thing I would say is nobody used to argue with the principle that the parents were in charge of their kids. Now what happens? Now we have an increasing tendency on the part of the government 
to say, you know what, in the interest of making life better for everybody, we have to tell everybody how it's going to be done. Now, a lot of what drives this agenda that we're talking about is money from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Can you think of any other government program that's been in the news recently that came from the Department of uh, Health and Human Services that's gotten people riled up? So if you don't like Obamacare, what makes you think you're going to like this? Right? Same people. Okay. Now this just again repeats what's uh, in that statute that I told you about, and I just want to reinforce that you can go in and exercise these things, and if somebody says, I'm not sure I want to do that for you, if you whip out a copy of the statute and say, I'm following the law, how about you? What are they going to say? They're going to have to do it. First of all, it sounds like you know what you're talking about. Number two, it's real easy to understand. So even if they don't have the chance to study it up in advance, you can show it to them and they can, they can sort it out. Now one of the other nuggets that lurks in the education code is that one of the foundational principles for education is to encourage family communication and involvement. So how do you encourage family communication and involvement if you empower kids to know where to get resources confidentially without telling their parents? Okay. And the ultimate ace card is if they don't want to share information with you, you can always say, you know, I could do a public records request. So I send it in. It goes to your superiors who find out you didn't give me the stuff you're supposed to give me. And then they have to involve the school district lawyer, which costs money. And then the school district lawyer says, okay, we got to give them the stuff. So, do you want me to go over your head and beat the information out of you, or are you just going to do what you're supposed to do anyway? Okay? I would kind of call that heads I win, tails you lose. <laughs> and the thing that's ironic about all of this is Oftentimes, there's a real pushback to trying to get kids to be able to avoid this curriculum, but there's specific uh, provisions in the, in, the, uh, in the statutes that say a teacher cannot be disciplined for declining to participate in the pre presentation of this kind of curriculum. So the teachers get a pass, but remains to be seen whether kids can. Now, uh, lest you think that what we're talking about is pie in the sky, um, hoping against hope that you have a chance, this is a list of communities that in the last couple of years have stood up to the local school district and said, you're not going to do whatever it was other than over our dead bodies. And they've won every single time. Some of those were curriculum things. Some of them were uh, uh, establishing a school-based health clinic. In each one of these situations, what happened was a group of determined parents went to school board meetings and said, you better not do this. And how do school board members get to be school board members? Okay. The customer is always right. So uh, among the materials that we have in the back that you can, uh, that you can look at um, is a, a longer list of things that you can do um, actively to, to, uh, to, uh, to address these kinds of things. And I just want to highlight a few. One is I want to make really clear that you understand I'm not anti-teacher or anti-education. Okay. I deal with people in the public schools all the time who are wonderful people, who try and do the right thing. Many of them are people of faith. Many of them are people of goodwill, even if they're not people of faith. Obviously, there, there's uh, the other kind as well. But don't assume that they're against you. I always encourage people to ask questions and 
in any event, to always be respectful. It's what Lori and I talk about as being respectful resolve. I'm not going to take no for an answer, but I'm going to smile while I don't take no for an answer. Okay? And a lot of times what you'll find is that some of these administrators are in a very difficult position because they're caught between their superiors who think that the Oregon Department of Education dictates everything and the, the parents who say, not on my watch, not with my kid. So what I encourage people to do is to ask questions and part of it is to figure out who's really the person that made the decision. Who is it that, um, that you need to convince to get the kind of action that you want? Uh, what is it that's keeping them from doing what you're asking them to do? And I believe that a lot of times, if you're persistent enough, then what happens is you get your way. Because sometimes school districts hold elections to get money. And sometimes administrators want to do something other than argue with parents over comprehensive sexuality uh, education curriculum and they're all busy. So what I kind of remind people is the squeaky wheel gets the grease and you can squeak and squeak and squeak and squeak. Now just think of it, for those of you who are parents, have you ever had a, one of your kids come to you over and over and over again and harangue you about the same thing? And you kind of eventually say, oh my gosh, how long is this going to go on? The same thing works on school principals and superintendents and school boards. If you remember in the Bible, the, the story of the, uh, the widow who came to the judge seeking justice, and she kept coming back and kept coming back and kept coming back, and the judge said, no, 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 no. And finally he says, if I give you what you want, will you go away and stay away? That works pretty good with school officials as well. The last thing I would say in this regard is it's not usually a good strategy to go in by yourself because they, what they will say is, you know what? You are the first person in Western civilization who ever raised this. But if you go in with five of your friends and they start to say, oh, you know, you're the only person in Western civilization that's ever mentioned this okay you get the idea because what they'll try and do is drive wedges or marginalize you sometimes or you know claim you're the only one well just because you're the only one doesn't mean you're wrong and if you have more people with you it makes it a lot harder for them to tell you to go away and you often have to be persistent with this If you get the handouts and you can read and you can share them with somebody, then you don't need me. Um, and ultimately, uh, what I would encourage you, you just have to be willing to stand in there because you're going to get oftentimes a lot of bureaucratic pushback. And if you don't yield to it and you know you're right, then you say, you know what? You don't want to talk to me today, but I'm going to be back tomorrow. And if you don't want to talk to me tomorrow, I'll be back the day after that. Oh, and by the way, in between, I'm talking to my friends and trying to get them to come in tomorrow and the day after. You start to get the idea. Pretty soon what you do is you turn this into a situation where the average principal or the average superintendent says, you know, I have 15 things on my to-do list that had to be done yesterday, and I'm still dealing with them. Okay? Okay. That's kind of the position you want to be in. Now, as I said, a lot of the money for this um, and certain portions of the curriculum comes from uh, HHS. Uh, there's a particular program uh, called the Teen Outreach Program, which has about $400 million behind it nationally from HHS in the name of health and so on. And 20 million of that goes to Planned Parenthood of the Great Northwest for use in the, uh, in the Northwestern states. 20 million, uh, or $4 million of that, 
is targeted just for the Salem-Kaiser School District. Now think for a moment what the Salem-Kaiser School District could do with $4 million from HHS if they could use it on instruction of the kind that they're supposed to be doing. Okay? So that money could be used for condoms or, shock of all shocks, it could be potentially used for teaching things like math and reading and science. So where do you want your money being spent? And as Lori talked about, and I just want to close with this, um, the Oregon Department of Education is committed to the principle that they know what's best for your kids. And they will use all sorts of highfalutin terms that don't mean anything to try and convince you otherwise. Hopefully you have some sense from having watched this that maybe that's not uh, all positive. Um, and what you want to remember is you may be dealing with a bureaucracy or an obstinate official. However, you do have the law on your side. And especially if you get a bunch of your friends with you and you have the law on your side and you're the customer, my guess is that's a pretty potent combination. And what a lot of school districts will hide behind is ODE is telling us we have to do this. Well, then you go to ODE and say, so are you mandating certain curriculums? Oh, no, we would never think of doing that. So what is that? You're getting the flim flam from both levels of government. You have the local people saying the, the bullies in Salem are making us do it. And the bullies in Salem are saying we would never think of imposing anything on anybody. Well, as Lori mentioned, the Adolescent Sexuality Conference earlier this week, there, was a, there were 100 people who were doing a silent protest. And before they got there, Steve Dean wrote a column talking about what was going to go on at the Adolescent Sexuality Conference. And by the time all of that happened, and some other things I'm not at liberty to share, all of a sudden, the Oregon Department of Education understood that people were on to them. And let's just say they're not very happy about it. <laughs> but the reason I tell you this is, is just simply this. If it becomes untenable for school districts to resist parents, how much authority do you think the Oregon Department of Education has not very much, okay? So that's why we say local control is nothing without parents' control. And this is just a slide about our group. It's got our website, our mission statement. We have information in the back that I encourage you to pick up. But what we hope most fervently is that you understand that you have a lot of resources at your disposal. This is not a battle that you have lost before you ever start. And if you go in equipped, you can advocate for your kids, you can advocate for other people's kids, and ultimately you can stuff this agenda right back in the, in the bottle from which it came. Okay? So I think we have maybe five minutes for questions. Uh, and then we have to close up, so. Sir? Legislative overview, oversight of the ODE? Of course there is. Do you think anybody's paying attention, though? No. Who's in charge of funding for ODE? The legislature. Mm -hmm. So if you tell your legislator, how come we're pouring all kinds of money into stuff where they're trying to do stuff in secret without parents finding out? The question was, how much does the state put into uh, to, to the Adolescent Sexuality Conference. And what you have to remember, it's not just ODE, although they're kind of the leaders. It's the Oregon Health Authority, it's the Department of Human Services, it's the uh, Attorney General's Task Force on Sexual Violence. There's all kinds of state stuff going into it. Um, thank you, I'd like to speak to that. Um, you do not have to be experts. I'm surely not an expert, but you're a parent. 
or a guardian or you have a niece or nephew or whatever, um, ask questions. You don't have to be the expert, you ask the questions. How much does it cost to put this on? I mean, those are kind of questions you can ask. Go to your school board, read some of the curriculum verbatim, and then ask them questions. Let them comment. So don't feel like you have to go in as, as a full-blown expert. Do they still get the same amount of money? It's a good question. I'm not sure on that, but I do know kids, uh, if a kid is pulled for a day, they don't get the money for that day. That's why attendance is a big deal. Um, and um, you may have students, children in p private school or homeschooled, but you have to understand, um, like my niece whose mother is a single mom, she can't afford to do that. She, is, she can't do homeschooling. So please take this information with you to your district, to your area in Oregon. Um, this is this little yellow sheet. We have a lot of information, but this is your marching orders for something you can do right now. Um, this Adolescent Sexual Eye Conference just happened. They're here in our footsteps. And um, just choose one or two things to do and, and um, start asking a, a lot of questions. Um, well, the, f the first one is if you ask to see the curriculum, you get to see the curriculum. That's how you find out. As far as a, a lot of the information we've shared is on uh, our website. Uh, there's a lot of other links to other things. Believe me, this is something where if you start digging a little bit, it's going to lead you to something else. It's going to lead you to something else. Lori and I have been working on this for almost three years together. And we're still figuring stuff out. But the point is, we know where to look and we know what to do so we can tell people what to do and where to look in such a way that they can start to ask questions. And w believe me, what the people pushing this agenda do not want is a lot of people asking questions. Okay, in the back, sir? Well, and, and let me just say, speaking of the top program, in the Salem-Kaiser School District, they had it too in two high schools. And by the way, they targeted the minority high schools. Okay. And there was one parent who got wind of this, and he went to a school board meeting and he said, is it the policy of the Salem-Kaiser School District not to discriminate against anybody? And he read off the protected classes, and they said, well, of course that is. And he says, then why would the, why would the Salem-Kaiser School District be contracting with an organization with a known history of being... Uh, engaging in racial discrimination and, and selection on the basis of race. There happened to be a couple of reporters there. Their pencils might have started to scribble really quick. And what ultimately came out of that, he had tumbled to some information. And when he finally asked to see the contracts, whereby the district um, um, entered into a contract with Planned Parenthood to present this program. The school had not, the, the superintendent had signed the contract had, as had a representative of Planned Parenthood of the Great Northwest, but the name of the other party to the contract was left out, which then may have created some attention with the media, like why would the superintendent sign a blank contract where we don't know who the other party is? not good business and it didn't play well so well what I would say is I don't know what teachers are feeling but there's obviously going to be a lot of pressure for people to conform you know if people in the system kind of have to play by the system's rules now what is it that's going to make it possible for teachers and administrators not to cave into that pressure it's a whole bunch of parents so Part of the reason I think it's good to raise this is there are a lot of good people in the system who really don't want to play ball with this. But if they don't have parents watching their back, it's really hard for them from within the system to challenge the prevailing paradigms. But if they can say, you know what? I heard from 20 parents last week who said, you got to be kidding, and I'm not going to stand for it it starts to percolate through the system, which is what all the people pushing it don't want to have happen, well, you know. And I would just encourage you to listen for those buzz, buzzwords, anything to do with health, safety, and start having conversations with kids. You know, I, I've sat down with kids, it's amazing what you can find out when you start asking them what they're seeing and hearing at school.